Welcome to Church on the Rise. It is our hope that you are encouraged, enriched and enlarged as you listen to this week's message. You're going to a 50th school anniversary last weekend in Sydney. Some of the eagles had lost their feathers. (laughs) And I was fascinated to notice a very interesting thing. In fact, Ron, what I'll get you to do is just skip ahead to a slide for me right at the very end. It's the third last one, the one with the poem and the pig. And what I noticed was this. My best buddy in school gave me this poem. Would you like to have a look at it? It was early last September, as nearly as I remember, I was walking down the street in tipsy pride. No one was I disturbing as I lay down by the curbing, and a pig walked up and sat down by my side. As I lay down there in the gutter, thinking thoughts I dare not utter, a lady passing by was heard to say, Oh, you can tell a man who boozes by the company he chooses, at which the pig got up and quickly walked away. (laughs) And you know one of the interesting things? We're at the rocks in a little pub that the guys had all arranged. Most of them are not Christians. And I noticed a very interesting thing. After the initial contact and checking out the feathers and saying how old are you and what have you been doing and all the normal things that you chat with after a 50-year getaway, slowly as the evening wore on, people began to go into like groups. And the kids who were Christians, who I'd been friends with and I'd just become a Christian at 15 in high school, slowly coalesced together. And the others who really loved their drinking and were drinking to excess, slowly got into like groups. You see, it's what's in your nature that determines how you congregate. Now, I don't know if anybody here has got any problems with drinking, but the lesson is there if you like to take it. I would like to share a story before we go to... Ron, you can just take the slide off for a moment. And I'd like to tell you a tale of two trees... It still reminded me that I preached on this verse here at this church one year ago. Longer? And I also took some of the thoughts and we shared it at uh, our Pastor Albert's funeral just recently. Where are you, Jill? I can't see you hiding out there. And it's a verse that has impacted me greatly in the whole of my life. So are you ready for the Word of God? I loved the worship. It was great to come back and feel the sincerity and passion that you have in the worship. What I'd like to do now is get down to the reason why we as a church exist. I have a riddle, I have a story, and then I have a question. The riddle you'll find in the book of Ecclesiastes, slide two. If a tree falls to the south, south, or if a tree falls towards the north, That's where the tree falls, and Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, made this wonderful observation, that's where it lies. Now, I read this when I was a 16-year-old boy, and I looked at that and I said, if he's the wisest man who ever lived, I'm in good company, I could have said that. (laughs) And it doesn't make much sense about trees until you realize he is not speaking about trees, he is speaking about you, people. You want a verse for that? Second slide, third slide, whatever it is, run. The tree means a human being. Psalm 1 3, a good person is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Genesis 49 2, Joseph is like a fruitful bough or plant or tree. Isaiah 61, those who love the Lord shall be called. Remember Nebuchadnezzar who got proud about his Babylon and the angel said, Cut off the stump. Let it remain. Let the tree drop, but leave a stump, and in seven years he'll come back to normal. Trees, they're all the way through Scripture, and they're all about the ability to live in such a way that you know how to put the roots down, how to live in such a way that you're a good tree, and when you die you leave a legacy for your other generations. What does it mean to fall to the south? We'll go to the next slide. Falling to the south in the Israeli culture means that you fall away from God. Falling means death. To the north means to be with God. Let's go through those a moment. Falling away from God. 
It's interesting that in the south of Jerusalem, there was a valley called the Valley of Hinnom. It was where they burnt the rubbish, and it was always burning. When Jesus wanted to illustrate what uh, hell was like, And by the way, it's not very popular preaching today, and you won't hear it a lot in Pentecostal churches today because we've got so cultured and so respectable, we won't preach it like it is. Now, I'm not saying that about this church. All I'm saying is that it's not a popular subject because we like to be so respectful and so gracious and non-judgmental. We can't handle a God that says, if you do the right thing, you shall live. If you turn away from God, You'll die. In the day that you eat the tree, you shall die. We would like the four guys who got kicked out of the cricket game to have... How many have heard the appeal recently? Can we commute their sentences? Can we bring them back in? Anybody heard it? If they do that, they've lost all respect and the game becomes just another corrupt thing. So judgment we don't like. But here's the story of what Gehenna means. In the Valley of Hinnom... Two things happened there. They burnt the rubbish there. Before that, it was called Tophet in the Old Testament. The children of Israel who are idolaters would sacrifice their children to Molech. And Molech was a big pot-bellied god with a hollow belly and they would abort their children. When I say abort, sometimes they were alive. They would sacrifice their children in the valley of Molech. So it's interesting that when they say fall to the south, nobody in Jerusalem when they were listening to Jesus at this time had any doubt what he meant or what Ecclesiastes would have meant when Jesus was speaking about life after death. Now we'll talk more about that in a moment. Jesus said a bad tree brings forth bad fruit, it's good for nothing and what is the end of a bad tree? To be cast into the fire. Sobering stuff. Now if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I want you to listen very carefully because we are not playing church. The reason we exist is so that you can find God and find the reason that you were made. It would be a shame and a crime for you to be cast onto the rubbish heap of the universe. On the north, towards God, we see that it meant Zion. Zion was on the north part. And when they built the temple, they deliberately said, beautiful for situation on the sides of the north is the dwelling place of our God. So north has a significance. Uh, It also meant that further up north was Lebanon, cool and green. And there it said, a righteous man is like a Lebanon tree, like a cedar of Lebanon. A good tree brings a good life and benefits many. And he or she goes to be with the Lord. Philippians 1.23, Paul talking about trees once again, speaking about his life. He said, I long to go and be with the Lord, which is far better. But I know for me to remain and be with you is necessary at this present time. Actually, the word, I long to get away, luo, I long to be loosed. I long to let slip the anchor and get away from what's holding me here. And after we came back from the uh, reunion, we had a long chat with my best buddy. We had the same motel room, uh, he in one bed, I in the other. And, you know, we talked till one o'clock that morning. And we talked about exactly the subject. And I prayed and I said, Lord, give me the ability to lead people to Christ out of my school generation. I had the pleasure of doing that at about 10 years ago with a good friend of mine, Stephen, came to our church just after his wife passed away. And when we were up on the hill overlooking Nambour, we talked about giving your life to Christ and we had the pleasure of leading him in a personal commitment to the Lord. Now, Brian, the man who gave me the poem about the pig, was a musician, and he was the one we had the long talk with. But I'm looking forward to the next time. I've got an open invitation to come up to their home, and Nance and I gave them afternoon tea just the other day. So I'm looking forward to sowing a seed that will help his tree fall towards the north. One of the people I was speaking to said, well, I don't want to fall south, I don't want to fall north, I just want to get right white ants and just rot where I am. I said, it's not an option. You can do it with a tree, but you can't do it with a human being. You might lead a rotten life, but I tell you what, you don't have any choice whether it's north or south because it's what's in you that has determined which way you go. If we go to the next slide, please, Ron, let me give you a very sobering quote. This is from William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Arm in the 1880s. And this is what he said about the church in this century. The chief danger that will confront the coming century will be a bloodless religion without the Holy Ghost. 
Christianity without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance. Salvation without regeneration. Politics without God. Oh, we could stop there, couldn't we? And heaven without hell. We would all like just to have thoughts of heaven only. And folk, you need to balance your compassionate human nature with the fact that God is also judge. He is lamb and he is lion. He is judge and he is saviour. And today's subject is a fairly sober one to throw at you. So what I'd like to do then is give you a tale of two trees. You'll know the scripture. Shall we go to the slide, please, Ron? I'll read it for you. There was a certain rich man, clothed in purple and fine linen, and he said sumptuously every day. There was a beggar named Lazarus, laid at his gate and full of sores. Now, the one you have up there is from the message. So just to make it a little bit easier, let's stick with the message because I think the simplicity of it really hits home. He wasted his days in conspicuous consumption. One little girl said he lived scrumptiously. A poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, had been dumped on his doorstep. All he lived for was to get a meal from the scraps off the rich man's table. His best friends were the dogs who came and licked his sores. I lost my congregation when I told them I was at a chinchilla once and one of the boys in our church had an ulcer on his leg and a dog came up and started to lick it. He went to push it away, and an old timber getter who was in our church said, don't, let him do it, he'll lick it clean and it'll get healed. Well, I see I've lost a few of you already. And <laughs> he died, this poor man, who was taken up by the angels to the lap of Abraham. What is Jesus doing here? He is telling a story, and he's asking you to put, where am I in this story? The rich man also died and he was buried. Listen to the finality of that. The body goes to the grave, but in hell or Hades and in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham in the distance and Lazarus in his lap. This is a Hebraism for paradise, Abraham being the father of the Jewish race. Father Abraham, have mercy. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in water to cool my tongue. I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham said, child, remember. Now, if you've only got Two words to underline in your Bible. I'd like you to underline those two words. Son, remember. What does it tell you? Consciousness, identity, no loss of memory, and a dreadful awareness that you could have been more and should have been more. Why do we exist as a church? Abraham said, son, remember. In your lifetime, you got the good things and Lazarus got the, the bad things. It's not like that here. Paraphrase, it doesn't work like that in the afterlife. What happens here depends on what you've done in the previous. By the way, Jesus didn't believe in reincarnation. By the way, for all you people who like Buddha, Buddha never taught reincarnation. Does that surprise you? He, when asked about life after death, never gave a clear answer. He didn't know. It was the Hindu philosophers who added to the Buddhism that has made Buddhism what it is today. Besides, in all of these matters, there's a huge chasm set between us. Nobody can go from one side to us, to you, or back again. And the rich man said, let me ask you then, Father, please send him to the house of my father where I have five brothers. The high priest at the time was Caiaphas, who had five brothers. And Jesus is telling a story that is hitting them right in the middle of their political situation. Let them tell them the score and warn them so they won't come to this place of torment. And Abraham answered and said, they've got Moses and they've got the prophets to tell them the score. Pause there for a moment. Two groups of people in his audience. One group of Pharisees, one group of Sadducees. The Sadducees are the left-winged, left socialist Labour Party of the day. They don't believe in angel, spirit, life after life or resurrection. Sound familiar? By the way, does anybody remember Bill Hayden? He was the Governor General. He is an atheist, agnostic, now a deist, and he just got baptised in the Roman Catholic Church early this year. He rattled the cages of the Labour Party and when they were on Andrew Bolton talking about this and they were scratching their heads, why would a man who's got the humanist of the year, who's atheist, who's taught everybody that God doesn't exist, suddenly turn and get baptised at 86 years of age to go into the Catholic Church? And do you know what his answer was? He said, I have noticed that Christians 
are the ones who make compassion and mercy and they start hospitals and they've changed our society. And if we took Christians out of our culture, the government could not bear the cost of charities and religious and not-for-profits. I want to live, he said, in such a way now that I leave a legacy behind me which is not just an intellectual philosophy, but I want to live in such a way that my life means a difference. Well, did that put the possum among the pigeons in the Labour Party? It got very pushed down to the bottom of the knees. But when a man gets to the end of his life, he starts to say, what's it all about? I want to just depart from our slide for a moment. This last fortnight, I've had to take two funerals. One is my mother-in-law, my uh, good wife's mum, just passed away at 93. Lovely Christian. Not one person I've met has ever had a bad, a bad word about Murray, have they, love? She's just one of those absolute cuddly grandmas. Uh, I also, last week, had to take a service for uh, a good friend of mine, Joyce Shepherd, who was a colonic irrigation naturopath and a lovely Christian lady. And do you know what was wonderful about both those services? The sheer sense of joy, the sheer sense of hope, and the absolute sense of the angels came and took them to Abraham's bosom. I went to a New Age funeral just previously, and the sense, that, I mean, the poetry was lovely, the sentiments were delightful, but there wasn't a hope spoken, not one word of hope. And I went away with an absolute sense of heaviness in my spirit. Abraham said, they got Moses and the prophets to tell them the score. By the way, the Sadducees believed in the first five books, but they didn't want the last five books of the Old Testament because too spiritual, too much prophecy, too much uh, angelic encounter because they don't believe in angels. So let's get rid of the, all the parts that have about that and let's just stick with the first part. Trouble is angels are stuck in all through Genesis. They just should have read a bit more closely. I know Father Abraham, but he said, they're not listening. Look, if someone came back from the dead, they would change their ways. And Abraham replied with incredible finality, if they won't listen to the Bible, they wouldn't listen if somebody came back from the dead. Today, we would even be more skeptical. You would say, it's a hologram. He didn't really die, or they didn't die. We have all the trick photography, wouldn't we? And so I'm asking you, as we're talking today, to think of your friends and ask at what point have you seen it's important enough to interrupt your pleasantries to be able to talk to them about their soul. Many a man and woman of the past made it their ambition and their goal in life that if one day passed and they hadn't talked to somebody about the Lord, they felt that they'd let God down. That's a great ambition. Two trees. Let's go to the next slide, Rob. Uh, shall we go back one? Yes. Two trees. Rich man, Dives. Poor man, Lazarus. Hades, the place of departed spirits, where there's an afterlife. Jesus doesn't even bother sitting down. If you were in the audience that day, and by the way, all of Luke 16 is about rich Pharisees, and if you go through Luke 16, you'll see that the parable is all about rich people, poor people, stewardship, because the Pharisees loved money. The uh, Message Bible says they were obsessed with money. Recently, they had an excavation in Capernaum, uh, and the archaeologists found in the home of a Pharisee in Capernaum a $1,500 bottle of wine. That's how rich they were. They lived scrumptiously. And when Jesus was pointing, pointing out this story, the Pharisees were listening, knowing that the parable and the story was being spoken about them. Now, Jesus did a few things here. He corrected two groups. This is the only time in the Bible where you see Jesus correcting a group publicly. First one is the group of Sadducees. They believe no afterlife, no spirit, no angel, no resurrection. So they've got nothing to look forward to. And... When Jesus is speaking to them in Acts 23, that lists all of their beliefs, in Matthew 20 and 37, the Sadducees decided to give Jesus a trick. And they said, lady gets married, uh, brother dies. Lady, in the Jewish culture, had to take the next brother. Brother dies, lady marries again. Third brother, brother dies, lady marries again. Fourth brother, you know the story? I'd be checking out my coffee if I was the seventh brother, that's for sure. 
And they said, we've got him. How's he going to answer this one? Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And Jesus said, that's easy. He said, first, you don't know the power of God. You're making God as big as your little beliefs. Second, he said, in heaven, there's no marrying or giving in marriage. The plumbing, the hardware, and the gender are to serve the present location. He doesn't answer all the questions about the resurrection body. And he said, and the third thing is, you read the book, uh, and by the way, remember the Sadducees believe in the first five books of the Bible? So he goes to the first five books of the Bible and he pulls out the encounter of who? Moses with God. And God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Jesus said, they're alive. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And so he proves with one verse on a present tense. Anybody here do grammar at school? No. Okay. I'll take my word for it. On am. If he'd said, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it either means they don't exist or they died and that he hasn't got any power to do life after death. But he said, I am. He is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. So when you pass away and when your tree falls, you don't snuff it. You live. Your body goes in the ground, quiver. Your body there dissolves. We don't like to think about that. We'd all like to have the resurrection. We'd all like to have the rapture. However, your spirit, Solomon said, the life of an animal or spirit goes to the ground, but the spirit of man goes upward. There is a future for a human being. Now, let's talk about the good uh, side. There's two sections on Hades. He said good side and bad side, equivalent to north and south. And can I say, he's using a geographical description to point out a spiritual reality. So if Jesus is using pictures like flame and torment and thirst to try and describe a spiritual reality, how much worse is the spiritual reality? I've told you the story a couple of times when I was uh, in uh, Bible college, all the students went off down the Brisbane River to Bishop's Island for a picnic. And just as the boat is just to pull out of the uh, harbour, a guy comes running down the gangplank. He jumps on the, boy, on the boat says, oh, I'm so glad I made it. He said, I uh, nearly missed the boat, didn't I? And to his horror, he found he is an, <laughs> he's an unbeliever. He's a fairly vile mouth. He's on board with a bunch of happy, clappy Christians who are going for a day's picnic. And all day long, he's, this is the day, this is the day. And he has got the heebie-jeebies at the end of the day. When the boat pulled into shore, he ran up the gangplank swearing. Why? Because if you went to heaven and you were a sinner, you would be more in pain in heaven than you would be with people of your own ilk. In 1977, the worst air crash in the world still is the worst uh, for fatalities. In Tenerife in the Canary Islands, fog coming in, it's at 1,200 feet high, there's a Spanish aircraft controller. There's a Dutch flying a KLM plane, 747's big planes. There is an uh, American on a uh, Pan Am flight. And they are so filled up to capacity, there's uh, planes parking on the taxiing runway. Some of you will know the story. As the KLM pilot gets his instructions... He thinks he's cleared for takeoff, and the pilot says, OK. Uh, the controller says, Roger, and they've changed all the instructions, though, because nobody knows quite what they meant. He thought he was cleared for takeoff. At that point, a 747 Pan Am is ready to taxi off. As he's on full throttle, the KLM pilot suddenly hears, Turn left, turn left, get off the runway. He turns left, but he doesn't get out in time, and the Pan Am flight comes at full throttle and takes off and the undercarriage hits the back of the KLM pilot and the whole place explodes in flames. They've got 40 tonnes of fuel on board. The man who wrote the story was a full gospel businessman and he said, I understand now what it means when a tree falls to the north and the south. He said, I was sitting next to the most beautiful business people in class cocking the little finger, sipping the thing, having their sherries. And suddenly when this hit, he said, a wall of flame shot up 
from the edge of the back of the plane and was rushing towards us. He said, I looked up, I called on God for help. He said, I called out Jesus. But he said, the people beside me said, Jesus Christ. Excuse me. And they went it one way. He meant it another. He looked up. He saw a hole torn in the fuselage. He jumped up, cut his hands on the side of the aluminium and ran out onto the wing full of fuel along with a whole heap of other passengers. And as this wall of flame came rushing up, he said, I could not believe the blasphemy and the swearing and what was in the heart of a human being at the moment of death. He said, I looked, and you know how tall those 747s are, quite a few stories off the ground. He said, I jumped, I broke both ankles, and I crawled away before the thing went, Poof. what you are at your moment of death determines your destiny. And you can't change it. Sadhu Sundar Singh, that great Indian mystic, he said, sin is like a typewriter and it's got... You know, does anybody remember typewriters and carbon paper and black ink? And every time you sin, it hits and puts another little bit of darkness. And if you don't get it cleaned up, he said, by the end of your life, you've got... And you're full of darkness. One other thought before we move on for all your scholars. In... The Greek, there's an interesting figure called many ands, A-N-D-S, polysyndeton for all you Greek buffs. And it means that when you see and, 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 so and the rich man died, and he lifted up his eyes, and he was in torment, it means stop and think about each one of these phrases. Don't hurry, look at each phrase. Let's talk about rich man for a moment. The contrast is not are you rich or are you poor, because the money is not the issue. In the Jewish culture, if you were a rich man and you were a good Jew, one of your great obligations was giving alms, charity. If you were ungodly, you turned away and you didn't give alms, you didn't give charity. So every day, Lazarus, sitting at the gate, all he's got to live on is dog saliva and scraps from a table. What is a Jewish beggar going to do, sitting there at the doorstep, waiting for the next scrap? He's got nothing left in life but to pray, has he? So you see a poor man, not because he's not godly because he was poor, but his heart turns towards God. The rich man is not ungodly because he's rich. He's ungodly because he's selfish. He turns his back on his fellow human being, and he lives a life that is so totally selfish. Let's go to the next slide. Where a tree lies simply means this. You exist after death, even though your body goes to the grave. At death, what you are is made manifest. You gravitate because the sum total of your soul dictates where you're comfortable. In fact, I have this simple statement. I don't think God sends anybody to hell. You go there because you were made for it. Or rather because you chose darkness rather than light. In fact, in Matthew 25, what did Jesus say when they said, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and didn't we do that? He said, depart from me, go into everlasting fire for the devil and his angels, because it was prepared not for mankind, it was prepared for who? The devil and his angels. The only solution that God had to the rebellion of Satan and his angels was to say, then guys, you can go where you like and you can congregate together. Now, is... The fire of hell, literal. I personally, I don't quite think so, but I'll leave that with you to argue about. I think the spiritual picture is far, far worse than the literal, which is why hey, uh, Dives, by the way, Dives means rich man, says, cool the tip of my tongue in water. It's a earthly picture to get across a far more worse spiritual reality. If you understand this, you won't be so blasé about your neighbours and your family and friends. And that's, again, the reason why I say we exist as a church. Not to have a, I was saying it to Les this morning. We're not here because we want a glee club. We're not here because of a happy club of service. Oh, it's wonderful to worship. I love the congregational sense of when we get together, we have corporate worship. It does, it's almost antiseptic, isn't it? It takes you out of your small club and out of your woes and your anxieties, and it simply says God matters more than just this life. Next thought there, you gravitate where your nature takes you. If any children are here, get a piece of paper sometime, put some iron filings on top, put a magnet underneath, 
and watch the patterns you can make with the cool little iron filings because you gravitate and the same way. When the resurrection comes, when the rapture occurs, you automatically go to where what's inside. Whoever has a son has life and whoever does not have a son does not have life. When the Lord suddenly sounds a trumpet and the resurrection is sounded, he resurrects the mortal body. He reunites you with your intermediate state, spirit, and you are suddenly like God intended you to be. And it's like those iron filings. If Christ is in you, you automatically go to be with the Lord. We are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. I had a, one of the most sobering reads on the uh, internet I've had for a long while, and if anybody wants to make a note of it sometime, by the way, if some of you are having difficulty making notes, if you want the uh, PowerPoint, leave your email for me and I'll send it to you. If you have a look at, just Google, deathbed experiences, and you'll find some of the most sobering comments that I have ever heard in my life. I'm coming towards the end, and I'd like to give you two of those. The first one is Voltaire, the French atheist. He was responsible for writing stuff that Karl Marx and the humanists, and later on Charles Darwin, made their teachings on, and their godlessness. There are two stories about Voltaire's death. The first one is by his family, who don't want Voltaire to be known as somebody who couldn't face death. So in their family memoirs, they put, uh, he went out slowly like a candle after four days of pain and suffering. But when you read the story about the nurse who looked after him, let me tell you what the nurse said. He had a problem with pain because of an internal problem. He got a, a blocked bowel. The doctor gave him opium. He doubled the dose because he'd been living on 50, 50 cups of coffee a day. He was in such pain that after a while, his bowels wouldn't work. And when his friends came to see him, these are his humanist friends, they tried to comfort him. And, but he was in such pain, all he could groan was, and I won't say it on the tape, JC, he would groan the name of Christ in swearing. And when he was dying, and he only had a few days left to live, his humanist friends closed the doors so that people outside wouldn't see what was actually happening to Voltaire when he came to die. And he died in agony and in pain, and he then just slowly tapered away, took his last breath. No hope, no life. And as I was reading his life story, and I, can, I, I deliberately went to see the opposite side to see, is this an urban myth? Because sometimes we Christians are guilty of urban myths. I then checked out a few others, and I was amazed to find the story of some of the other atheists, David Hume, who, when they came to see him and said, would you like to repent and give your life to Christ? He said, don't mention that name to me. And don't talk to me about hell because he said, hell is already here in my breast. I can feel it even before I get there. And when you look through that, and I encourage you to take the website sometime, the contrast with Christians is amazing. One missionary, Appleby, about to die and go to be with the Lord, he says, oh, what rapture, what peace, what light, what joy, they come for me. And his face lit up. One of the gentlemen in the story was a Christian. And as he sat up in his deathbed, he put his hand out like that. And his son said, Dad, what are you reaching for? And he said, I'm reaching for another kingdom. I'm reaching for another kingdom. The little daughter of uh, one of the missionaries that he was giving a story of was, she is 10 and passing away. The family is just in grief. And she says, ah, oh, the light. She says, the joy. She said, the angels. I just want to go. Please don't hold me back. I just want to go. See, when you tree comes to fall, it's what's in you that determines which way you go. Now, this is a story of two trees. Skip the next slide, Ron, and go to the last one, if you would. My question. I promised you a riddle. I've given you the story. Now, my question is, which way will your tree fall? 
I wouldn't be a good friend to you or a good pastor if I didn't make an appeal right now, and I want to do that. I want Christians just to bow their head and pray. There may be somebody in this meeting today who hasn't made that decision. He that has the Son has life. And sir, madam, I don't know who's all here today and what you're believing, but I've told you what Jesus said. When my friend Brian, his wife, said to me, what do I do about the Old Testament, the New, my comments was, find what Jesus said, and then you'll understand the Old Testament. And this is what Jesus said. So I'm asking right now whether you would say, God, I know I'm not ready, but I want my tree to fall towards the north and not the south. When I first was a boy of 15, I heard three gospel messages, and on the third one, the preacher said, Son, if you died tonight, which way would you go? So now you know why this verse means so much to me. And something skipped over my head. It went down to my heart. And he said, it said, I am not ready to meet God. And that's when I stepped out and gave my life to Christ. So now I'm going to ask a simple response. Who here this morning has never made the peace with God? And you'd like to say, that's me. Just put up your hand, slip it down. And I'm going to pray. If you're all Christians here this morning, I'm going to go to the next part of my appeal. And that's this. Christian, when was the last time you soberly looked at your relationship with your friends and spoke to them about their soul? We're not here just to have church. We're here to exist for the salvation of others. And I'd like us as a church just to pray a simple prayer of consecration to the Lord, making ourselves available now, if you can't pray the prayer all the way through, just stop. Don't commit perjury. But let me take you through it a phrase at a time. Lord Jesus Christ, pray it with me. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for bringing me into the kingdom. I thank you for keeping me in a way of life. I want to serve you. I would like to tell my friends about you. And I pray right now for boldness and courage and insight and just knowing the right words. And I pray it in Jesus' name. I pray for God moments at work, at school, at home, when we travel. Give me the moments that touch lives and help me to win a soul to Christ. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this week's message. If we can help you in any way, please get in touch with us via the web at caloundra.churchontherise.org.au.